Hello, Eorzeans! Welcome back to the fall and rise of Final Fantasy XIV. And I have to make two corrections from my previous video. One minor and one major. So let's get the minor one out of the way first. Uh, there were forums during the alpha and beta tests, but not at launch. This was just a silly error that I didn't catch while condensing my script, so yeah. Forums during testing, no forums at launch. Now then, the big correction is the one about the leaves. I mistakenly said that you had a limit of 99 leaves that recharged 4 every 12 hours. Well, it was actually worse at launch. Only 8 leaves were available every 36 hours. This was simply wiped from my memory, and I apologize for this error. I will do better in this episode, I promise. Also, massive shout out to everyone keeping me in line. It's important that this series is accurate, and you're all a big help. Now then, where were we? Oh yeah, the game trying to make you stop playing. So let's say you are in need of some gear, because gods you would be, seeing as gear drops were ridiculously rare due to the lacking content. Well, you'd have to go visit your local market ward. The most popular one at the time being Ulda, due to its close proximity to the Etherite Crystal and other amenities. Back in 1.0, Limsa was the least popular city-state because of its outspread layout, and where you would now find the Aetherite Plaza in a Realm Reborn, there used to be... nothing. Except for this statue, which ironically looks like one of the Realm Reborn Aetherite crystals that would soon replace it. So we're going into the market wards. You now have to choose from a list where you wanted to go. There were different wards for different things, but with names like Tinkerer's Row and Upper Tailor's Row, you really had to learn where you wanted to go. Each ward had its own specialty, so as in the case of Upper Tailor's Row, you would mostly find gear ranging from level 41 and up. Thus the, uh, upper, I guess? Once inside, you were presented with this. These are retainers. Retainers would be placed here with whatever their owner told them to sell, and no, there was no search system, so you had to browse them manually and hope that one of them had something you needed, and pray they've priced them sensibly. Often people didn't, because they knew people wouldn't want to search for an item all day and compare prices, and you had no choice but to buy it. To make it all better, because of the limitations on how many characters you could see at any one time, you had to move around to ensure you could load up all the retainers, so you can probably just imagine how fun that was. Oh, but there was more in store for unsuspecting players. The game's fast travel system, the Aetherites. Uh, generally, when people that didn't play 1.0 look at a 1.0 map, they usually exclaim that there are a lot of Aetherites around. Well, maybe the Aetherite density is slightly higher than in the Realm Reborn, but boy, <laughs> the devs had a treat for us. Anima. And no, I'm not talking about the Heaven Sword Anima relic. I'm talking about the real OG Anima, the 1.0 teleport currency. Oh yes. In 1.0, you didn't pay gil to fast travel. You had to use a, you guessed it, rechargeable currency. And you're thinking to yourself, well, it can't be that bad. Girl, please. You could only carry a maximum of 100 anima at any given time. Teleporting within your current region cost 4 anima, while teleporting to another region cost about 6 anima. Fair enough, you think. But how fast does the anima recharge? Well, hold on tight. You'd get one anima every four hours. I, 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 I can't even comment on that. Well, Lukiel, you say, why didn't you just use your chocobo to get around? Yes, sure, there were chocobos around. You could see them in every city-state and sure, they had saddles and the whole set up there, but hey, who needs to actually ride them, right? Right? Yeah, that's right. In Final Fantasy XIV 1.0, you couldn't ride chocobos. They were just unfinished decorations in the city-states with no actual functionality whatsoever. So that meant you had to actually walk through the, the Black Shroud on foot. Physically moving from this point to this point on foot. Why? Well, okay, let's take a few steps back and look at one of the assets that was sure to be one of the redeeming qualities of this game. The trademark all Final Fantasies pride themselves with. The main story. Well, 
The opening cinematics for the initial city-states sure seem to tease one hell of an interesting main story plot. But the air is quickly kicked out of it after the first initial quest. What seems like a great engaging story with lots of interesting and intriguing plot devices is soon replaced with dull and empty quests involving shallow NPCs you never see again and fetch quests with little to no relevance to the plot. And yes, I am aware that the latter was pretty normal at the time, but the reason why these fetch quests were especially infuriating was that the main story was spread so thin you could go as long as 10 levels before actually unlocking a main story quest. And then hey, fetch quest with no actual relevance. And you're thinking, 10 levels? Pfft, get good scrub. You've clearly forgotten about the 8 leave quests every 36 hours, the lack of mobs in the overworld, and the fatigue system. All in all, the main story arc was overall flat and not very interesting. Sure, there were some instances where the main story was intriguing, but all in all, it felt rushed and thin. To 1.0's credit though, the first part of the main story is actually split into three different versions, depending on what city-state you choose to start in. So to sum up the main storyline for 1.0, I'm going to use Limsa Luminsa's storyline as our starting point, and I'll explain it in broad strokes until it merges with the unified main storyline. I'm actually considering making a 1.0 story summary video in the future. Let me know in the comments if you're interested. For now, I'll just go through the key plot points in the 1.0 Limsa storyline. Okay, here we go. You, the adventurer, wakes up in a ship hearing a soft singing voice, yet despite clearly hearing someone, you cannot see anyone fitting that voice around you. The voice calls out the ever-famous words hear, feel, think. You start exploring the ship, and eventually you walk out on deck. And hey, foreshadowing meteor shower. Then the ship gets attacked by jellyfish. You meet Yastola and Stallman, and together you fight the jellyfish. But hey, sea serpent, you finally arrive in Limsa Lominsa, and everything is great. Some stupid Lalafell in the Fisherman's Guild asks you to escort another stupid Lalafell to Ocean's Torch. But wouldn't you know it? There are dead bodies everywhere, and two shady blokes standing around. Apparently one of the guys wants to make an agreement with the Sahagans, but then they spot you, and they leave. You head back into town, and it becomes clear that the Sahagan have been attacking a lot lately, especially around Ocean's Torch, so it sure was nice of that Lalafell to send a new adventurer to that very dangerous place with another helpless Lalafell, huh? Huh. Anyway, you meet Badron, and he starts telling you about a place called Seal Rock. A mysterious island that is famous amongst the Lominsons for hiding away some massive treasure. Anyway, you meet up with Yastola again and she tells you she's looking for a shadowless man that apparently stands accused for murdering Sahagans and basically being the reason why the Sahagin are so enraged. Badaron tells us that the Lalafell we escorted earlier, Sisipu, wants to talk to you. Sisipu, being a fisher herself, reveals a very secret fishing hole and asks to meet there. When you finally meet up there, hey, wouldn't you know it, Stalman! The first Squadron Commodore you met on deck in the beginning cutscene is here. Stallman tells us who he thinks is the perpetrator behind the Sahagan killings, a guy called Emmerich. This Sahagan drama continues for a while and there is some fighting, lots of deaths, and pretty cool all-female pirate crew that shows up. There's also a brief moment in the story where we get a good look at the Musketeer class that we would sadly never get. Also just an important sidetrack here, take a look at this weapon. This is the 1.0 Arcanist main hand. In 1.0 Arcanists, or Arcanists, were supposed to wield a staff and not a book. Yorianje used to carry one. Well, back to the story. At one point, you head to God's Grip in Lenosha to find Yastola engaged in a battle with Stallman. Stallman has found the supposed key to Seal Rock, but does not know how to use it. He wants Yastola to tell him, but she refuses and battle ensues. You are suddenly blinded by a bright light and you find yourself alone. Well, until you start looking around, and you finally witness Solman and two other shady dudes in a rushed conversation about planning to claim the treasures of Seal Rock for their own gain. Yastola appears before you and explains that you both possess the ability to view the happenings of the past, the Echo. And again, we're served with some great unintentional foreshadowing.
A meteor shower suddenly erupts from the skies, raining light down upon you and the others. Shortly after, the shadowless man appears and steals the key from Stallman. Yashtola tries to stop him, but he disappears. Shit happens, you wake up in Limsa Lominsa again, and hey, Badron is there. You remember Yashtola mentioning the Echo. Discussing this with Badron, he tells you that a man called Blackburn left a message telling you to visit the Path of the Twelve, located in the Merchant's Ward in Ulda. And this is where the main story merges with the other city-state storylines and becomes one unified story. The main story quest started at level 1, but was spread out over four level caps, level 1, level 10, level 15, and then finally, level 20. Some of the gaping issues with the game was already known to the devs before launch, but Square Enix's view on this was that the game could be patched after launch and had insisted on a quick release and, arguably, earning a quick buck in the process. No big deal, it's Final Fantasy, we'll be fine. But then came the reviews, and it finally dawned on everyone that this game would not be ushering in the new golden era of Final Fantasy. The reviews were mostly negative, scoring 14 at 50% on game rankings and 49 out of 100 on Metacritic. UK video game magazine Computer and Video Games said, Eorzea is a beautiful world with huge potential for vast adventures, but it's just a shame that this first voyage into it is such a misstep. IGN stated that, Much of the promise with the combat system and depth of the crafting mechanics are drowned, unfortunately, under a sea of interface and performance issues that hinder the experience at nearly every step. Further stating that while patches might improve the experience, its state at the time of the review made it not a world worth visiting. GameSpot, in addition to warning players away from the game, said that Final Fantasy XIV is a notable entry to the genre, but only for what it lacks. One of the most devastating reviews, however, came from PC Gamer, calling the game a shallow, slow, grind-heavy MMO crippled by a horrible interface and nonsensical limitations. Critics agreed that the game's graphics were good, and the game's score by Nobu Uematsu was enjoyable and great. But that was as much praise as the game would get. Criticism was laid against the game's gameplay pace, its convoluted interface, bugs and glitches, and the incredibly slow pace of the main story. The leave system was criticized for being too restrictive, and the fatigue system was confusing and unnecessary. It was generally seen as a great disappointment, both as an MMORPG and a mainline entry in the Final Fantasy series. Final Fantasy XIV is now in serious trouble. The release of the game sparked immediate player backlash in addition to its negative critical reception, throwing Square Enix into damage control. The initial 30-day free trial was extended twice, while the game received heavy patches to rectify the worst bugs and glitches. But the ship was sinking. Fast. Player numbers were declining at an incredible rate, and the bad reviews just kept coming in. The dev team is overwhelmed. With one problem solved, another one shows up. The game's servers are unable to keep up, and players already struggling with frame rate drops now face massive lag as well. And we're talking game-breaking lag, as in mobs actually being two skills ahead of you while battling. This would probably not surprise you if you knew that the game was designed in such a way that every interaction was registered server-side and not client-side. That's right, even your menu. So, if the servers started lagging, well, you'd have to wait for your menu to load. If you even had time to do that between the server crashes. Mid-October 2010. The servers would now constantly crash and maintenance would often take hours to complete. November 2010. Tanaka appears in interviews apologizing for the state of the game. Whatever happened behind the scenes in Square Enix HQ is difficult to know, as Square was usually extremely tight-lipped about its business practices at the time. The game was in a surreal limbo, where no one really knew what was going on. Just to add to the absurdity on the lodestone, it was business as usual, with patch notes and messages from the devs about trivial things like crafting and gathering tips. Then, in December of 2010, Square Enix announced that the PS3 version was to be indefinitely delayed from its original March 2011 release date, with Square Enix saying that it would not release the game for that platform until it fully met the quality standard suitable for the Final Fantasy series. Oh yeah, I barely mentioned that. They planned for this game, this game, to be on the PS3. Seriously. Following this announcement, subscriptions for the Windows version were also suspended indefinitely. Finally, Tanaka speaks up. He takes full responsibility for the disaster's launch 
and shortly after, Square Enix announced that Tanaka and Komoto had both been removed from their positions as producer and director, respectively. Square Enix is quick to find a new dev team leader. One man would now fill the shoes of the two men before him. A man that had little to no experience with Final Fantasy titles in the past was put in charge of Square Enix's latest Final Fantasy title to save it from impending doom. Naoki Yoshida enters the stage, and Eorzea is about to be forever changed. But hey, we're gonna have to save that for episode 4. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode and series in general. If you did, please leave a thumbs up and subscribe if you're new around here. And as usual, leave a comment telling me what you think of this video and your favorite or worst 1.0 memory. I'll be back in the fall and rise of Final Fantasy XIV Episode 4. Dolomut is getting closer, guys. Until then, may you ever walk in the light of the crystal.